Holy potatoes, man. Just... Just holy potatoes, that's all I can say. I... that... we... we finally got it. We finally got our big Switch reveal, and there's so much to talk about and think about that I don't think I'm gonna sleep till March. First off, you're gonna want to know what I thought about the presentation. Well, it was amazing. And weird. And, uh... interesting. There were some disappointing aspects, and I can see why a lot of people were left unsatisfied. The biggest thing for me was that they just didn't reveal as many games as I think we would have liked, mainly for the launch. We've got Zelda, which is obviously huge, but as far as truly exciting stuff at launch goes, that's it. There's 1-2 Switch, but that's a party game, and those can only get me so excited, I'm sorry. There were some game reveals that were definitely cool, but most of them were for way later and just by chance didn't happen to fit my personal tastes. I'm not a big JRPG guy. On the price side, naturally I was hoping for a $250 SKU with a $300 deluxe bundle or something, because $300 for just the system is indeed asking a bit much. They're gonna start charging for online services, which I totally called by the way, but I can't make a final decision on that until I know more, primarily how much it'll cost. So that wasn't all the best, but at the same time... Wow! Haba! Super Mario! What?! Uh, <clears throat> no, uh, but that's a discussion for another day. Though I will say that I would have been considerably less impressed with the whole thing if it didn't have at least that one big, huge, megaton announcement. Overall, it was solid. It could have been better, but it could have been worse. It didn't quite deliver on the hype that the entire internet was riding on, but it didn't leave us out in the cold either. Thing is, the overall quality of the presentation isn't what I want to talk about at the moment. Or, not exactly. I know we go into this kind of thing with certain expectations, but there was so much more going on in that presentation than just gameplay and release dates and all that. It wasn't just what they told us, it was what they communicated. The event left us with a lot of questions, and Nintendo needs to follow up strong, but I'm here to tell you why what we just witnessed was an immensely important part of Nintendo's history, why it was a complete game changer, and why I'm excited beyond belief for the company's future. You've no doubt seen the title of this video, so I won't beat around the bush any longer. I feel that the Switch signals a massive change for Nintendo, a shift in their whole mindset and some of their core design philosophies. To me, the most obvious evidence of this is in the games. I know there isn't a lot there yet, but what is there speaks loads. You've all heard me moan and gripe about it enough to know what I thought one of the Wii U's big problems was. Nintendo was so happy with the success of the Wii that they put a huge focus on simple fun. I felt that not enough of the games provided the depth and scope that many gamers crave when they're done with their absolutely fine couch multiplayer silliness. I understand why they adopted this mindset, and in a different time or maybe handled a little differently, it might have worked. I was afraid that they would stick to the same mindset for the next system, but I couldn't have been more wrong. Sure, they've got their fun little games, their 1-2 Switch, and their woogly arms boxing, and their Bombermans, and indie games and all that, as well as the competitive multiplayer stuff like Mario Kart and Splatoon, but did you see what else they had? Did you see what they've been showcasing for the system? Breath of the Wild, Skyrim, Super Mario Odyssey, Xenoblade 2, are you noticing a trend here? This early in the game, and already they're putting a huge emphasis on big, open adventures. Mario alone is proof that they're moving away from linearity and familiarity and injecting their games with new creative mojo. Sure, Skyrim's a five-year-old game that we've all played, but once again, it's what they're communicating by putting such a big spotlight on it, especially so early in the concept's reveal. Nintendo's good at getting these little ideas in their head and basing all their decisions on them. Some of these ideas are better than others. When the first reveal trailer showed off Zelda and teased Skyrim, I thought, you know, it sure would be amazing if Nintendo's whole thing this time around was big epic games that you can take on the go. I thought that would be a fantastic idea to get stuck on, but I didn't want to, you know, get my hopes up. Then in the presentation, they confirmed Skyrim. They revealed the first exploration-heavy Mario game since Sunshine, which they specifically referred to as a sandbox experience. By the time Xenoblade 2 and all those Dragon Quests and stuff came around, I realized that my dream might have just come true. They are not dumbing down their games to make them more suited for portable play, or so Grandpa Joe can join in on the fun. They're making them bigger than they've ever been before. They're trying to wow us with just how amazing they can make a game that can be played anywhere. Some people will appreciate such power in a portable, but even the people who don't care about portability and mostly just want to play at home will appreciate the big, huge, awesome games anyway, because who doesn't love big, huge, awesome games? This is why I'm so stoked for the Switch, despite a relative lack of titles shown at the presentation. But it doesn't end there. There are other more subtle reasons I think the Switch represents a new Nintendo. And surprisingly enough, for the first time in the history of press conferences, part of it has something to do with the people talking to us from the stage. Okay, so like this guy. Have you ever seen this guy before? I've never seen this guy before. But he comes out on stage and what does he say? My name is Shinya Takahashi and I lead all Nintendo software development. 
Apparently Mr. Takahashi's been with Nintendo for a while, though most of his credits are relatively recent, and unless I'm wrong, it looks like he was very recently promoted into upper management. Then we've got Yoshiaki Koizumi, who's a Nintendo veteran. Look up this guy's list of credits. He's worked on, and in many cases directed, some of Nintendo's best games. He's the general manager of the Switch, and even though I personally can't remember ever seeing the guy before, he had the biggest presence at the show. Koichi Kawamoto is best known for the Brain Age games and a lot of the Wii, Wii U, DS, and 3DS's system apps. This guy's the general director for the Switch. Nintendo put these previously behind the scenes dudes up on that stage on purpose. My research could be completely wrong, and for all I know these could be the same guys who've been making all the Nintendo consoles, but it felt to me like, you might not know who we are, but we're here now and we're the captains of this Switch boat. President Kimishima gave us a lot of the big info and Reggie and Shiggy made brief appearances, but it was the non-familiars who really stood out. It gave the whole presentation a very different feel. It felt a little like mom and dad were out of town and the kids could do whatever they wanted. It gets so much better though. Again, these seem like small details, but to me, they combine into something huge. Like the announcement that the Switch uses USB-C for charging. That was literally one of the most exciting things in the presentation. You might be saying, what's the big deal, Arlo? That's industry standard. And my answer is exactly. It is industry standard. And that is not how Nintendo usually does things. I mean, normally they're bested only by Apple in the realm of expensive proprietary cables. Selling extra charging cables is a source of revenue for them, but this time around they saw that making the Switch easy to charge anywhere and everywhere and with any micro USB cable you've got lying around was of utmost importance. It makes the lower end of the battery life estimates more forgivable. It makes bringing the thing with you infinitely easier. That decision was huge. Storage, largely the same thing. They could have easily pulled a Sony and charged outrageous prices for proprietary memory cards as a way to boost the revenue from each unit sold. But nope, it was important to make it easy and simple, so that's what they did. Micro SD cards are cheap and have a high capacity. No storage issues here, problem and hassle entirely averted. And what's that? The touchscreen is capacitive instead of the inferior yet cheaper to manufacture resistive, providing an overall better and more user-friendly touch experience in line with every single other touch-enabled device on the market? <gasps> well, what do you know? Then there's region locking. I swear, I would have bet anyone with a wallet 50 bucks that the Switch would be region locked, but one of the first things they did was come out and say, nope, we did all that in the past, but we're done with it. Buy games from whatever country you want. Online play? Yeah, they're gonna start charging, but every report is saying that it's because they're gonna give us the full online experience we've been begging for for a decade, including stuff like voice chat. They've dragged their feet on nearly every one of these issues in the past, but the Switch screams user-friendly. It screams pro-consumer. It screams modern. Many get on its case for having what they consider to be not modern graphics, but as I said before, I really don't care. I truly believe that we're at a point where it barely matters, at least when they're giving us games this crazy amazing cool. And I can't claim to know a lot about hardware architecture and all that, but it sounds like the Switch is the easiest console to develop for in Nintendo's history. That means it's not only user-friendly, but developer-friendly, which of course just means more people making more games for us to play. Oh, and speaking of the games again, one last point, bringing back both double items and battle mode in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. They had absolutely no obligation to include either of those features, but it was something cool that fans have been asking for, so they did it. I can't be the only one who thinks that's something special. It's yet another thing that exceeded my expectations, something that makes me feel like they're listening and genuinely trying to make everything as awesome as possible. Now, in fairness, not everything about their current direction is perfect. The relative lack of games and all that is one thing, but the whole motion control, one-two switch deal did leave me feeling worried, or at the very least, wary. The reveal trailer didn't make any of that Joy-Con wackiness apparent, nor did it feature use of the touchscreen. Before this presentation, I thought the Switch was pure simplicity without any silly frills, and I was pretty happy about it. I like what touch controls can do for gaming. I have, in the past, enjoyed plenty of games that use motion controls. Having these two options is indeed just better than not having them due to the opportunities they afford, and I know it might be too early to tell for sure, but I'm leaning toward these extra features being kind of a bad idea in the long run. If the main draw of the Switch is power on the go, I feel like making it as affordable as possible should have been their goal. Putting accelerometers and IR sensors and HD rumble and a stinking camera sensor thing that can see your hand gestures? Really? Putting all that in there kind of muddles things up. Like, that's all pretty cool, but it can't come cheap. Between that and the touchscreen, we can basically be certain that the Switch could have come in at the $250 price point after all if they'd left it all out. We are paying for those extra bells and whistles. Now, generally I'm all for paying extra for extra quality and features, but 
I have to say I'm not sold on the we're still doing motion controls idea. It doesn't feel like it did when the Wii was first revealed and we were all super stoked on it. I personally could never control another motion again outside of VR and I would probably be happy. I feel like most people are just kind of done with it. It's had its time in the sun, but that time is over. And while stuff like 1-2 Switch looks like it could be fun, it's a bit of a party trick. It's the kind of thing you bring to a party or two and you're done with it after a few hours. ARMS certainly looks a bit deeper and a bit more fun, but if I'm honest, it's just not the kind of thing I'm into anymore. This all really reminds me of the 3DS. Nintendo included three different cameras on that thing, so people could take 3D pictures and there could be AR games and all that. But after playing with the cameras for a bit, you're done. And all the developers, including Nintendo themselves, are done with it as well, and the feature goes largely unutilized. Then, for the rest of the console's entire lifespan, people are paying for that hardware that they just won't use. The same goes for the 3DS's, you know, 3D feature. We all paid more and got less power so that the few of us who were interested could play games in 3D. Uh, the 2DS, of course, was an alternative, but lack of a clamshell design was a deal breaker for many. I was actually one of those people who liked 3D, but I recognized that I was in the minority. And then, of course, while I hate to admit it, this whole thing is also very reminiscent of the Wii U. The gamepad brought up the price considerably, so even after the concept fell flat, anyone who wanted the system had to pay a hundred bucks more than they should have paid for the power they were getting. That largely killed the system, and the Switch looks like it just might be making the same mistake again, though admittedly on a smaller scale. They're upping the cost by what I can only assume is at least 50 bucks to include features that most people might not even care about and might get left behind in a year, or even worse, end up awkwardly shoehorned into what would have otherwise been fine experiences purely in order to justify the feature's existence. <clears throat> uh, pardon me. I feel like most of us came at the Switch just wanting regular old games more than anything, so yeah, I'm a little bit uneasy about this. But hey, I fully admit I could be eating my words someday. If Nintendo really sticks to it and does a lot of new, interesting motion stuff, it could end up being a key asset to the system. Touchscreen, same thing. If they fully realize its potential without just making it convenient for item management, namely if they start allowing more level creation, which let's be honest, that was where the Wii U's biggest potential lay, I could someday be wondering what I would have done without it. The ball's in their court, basically. I'm skeptical, but certainly open to being proved wrong. I can see that opinions on the Switch are pretty split online. Uh, lots of people thought Mario and Zelda were enough to carry the whole thing, and lots of others weren't impressed. There's no doubt that Nintendo's got the work cut out for them, because as I've said before, the presentation could have gotten every last person hyped to buy a Switch, and it would still rest entirely on Nintendo to stick the overall execution. In the end, the main thing that matters is the games, and they just need to keep making them and never stop. The currently sparse lineup and the price are indeed hiccups, and it's obvious now that it's not going to have the uber-strong launch I was hoping for, but it feels like the sort of thing that could eventually get sorted out. There are only a handful of huge first-party titles set for release this year, that is if they don't announce more at E3, but those few games are immensely exciting. Even if the thing's first year ends up being less than stellar, I think we could easily see another 3DS type of late-start sales situation. Once it's got a good number of big titles, the sales start rolling along much faster, and once the price drops a bit and we get a Pokémon title, everyone's crazy for the thing. Coming back around to my original point, it's easy to give this whole situation a quick glance and think nothing's changed, but there's so much evidence pointing toward a new Nintendo that looks at things from our perspective. There's a new ambition there. You might think I'm putting too much stock in the games they've shown us so far, but I think they make all the difference. They didn't have to make the biggest, hugest, most series deviating Zelda ever, with voice acting of all things, something I never thought would happen. They didn't have to make a bizarre, creative sandbox Mario when 3D World 2 would have sold millions. They didn't have to make a full-fledged Splatoon sequel when even a slightly enhanced port would probably be fine. They didn't have to bring fan-favorite features back to Mario Kart, plus new characters and stages, plus all the old DLC, making for the most preposterously gigantic Mario Kart ever conceived. They could have continued providing limited networking features and selling us charging cables and locking their systems to individual regions, but they chose not to. Nintendo of the past was very careful and didn't like to dive headfirst into anything and wanted to stick to what they were comfortable with. Heck, the touchscreen and crazy Joy-Con features do worry me price-wise, but on the other hand, I'm kind of glad they went all out with it. I mean, the Wii was the most ambitious and innovative piece of tech to date, and even that came out of the gate lacking in functionality and later had to be upgraded with the Wii Motion Plus. At least this new tech is, I imagine, going to be able to do everything they want it to do. They didn't hold it back, just like they're not holding anything back this time around. To the skeptics I say, just give Nintendo some time. I won't deny that they could have set the launch up better. We shouldn't have to give them time and should all be scrambling to get a Switch on March 3rd. But look at the foundation they've built. Look at the mindset they've adopted. 
Look beyond the stuff that clouds our vision at this moment and see that this is a fantastic system and that great things are in store for it. I fully and truly believe that this is a new dawn for Nintendo. I'm sure my editor is giving me some sort of epic background right now, maybe a glorious sunrise. Probably some swelling, inspiring music. Yeah, I bet it looks awesome. This video was brought to you by my top patrons and by complete coincidence, my favorite dancing partners, Zoag, Zonjo, Zekanuva, Dr. Roskotnik from Wizard Dojo, Heroic Teddy, Stealth Dad, and his son Caden. Yo, Caden, what's up? Burgle, Aaron and Jeremy Sider, Seth Reich, Orinor, Renos, Shadow Minion, Gavin Feasel, Ben, and Frude Jackal. Remember, if you like what I do and want to check out my Patreon, you can help support the channel and get behind the scenes updates on what I'm working on for as little as $1 a month. See ya! <gasps> oh man, that's a mouthful. Jeez.